Hello and welcome to our source wall. My name is Elvis and as always, I'm your host. All right, so this is the last episode of 2020. It's been quite a year. There was a bunch of ones that I didn't really want to do because, you know, it was such a tough and obviously really, really traumatic year in general. But I'm glad we made it through 52 episodes again this year. I'm so proud of that. And we're going to start off this by just saying that this is going to be the end of your special, so we're going to be doing two things. I'm not going to be going through any news. There's some news topics that are kind of worth talking about, but they're also kind of ridiculous, and I don't want to, like, to sully the upbeat notion of this entire event. And um, no real comic reviews. I didn't really read anything this week. Uh, I didn't have the time, uh, but I'll push those forward to, like, next week. So this episode is going to be two things. The... Review for Wonder Woman 1984 because I do want to talk about that. Uh, there's a lot to talk about and some things I'll just briefly delve into with it. And also I want to give the results to the Unsourced Wall Favorites of 2020, which is our best of award show. Um, this is the second one we've done and I'm really proud of it too. I'm glad the response that we got and it's going to be fun to delve into what people actually liked. So let's get on with it. All right, so let's start off with uh, Wonder Woman 1984. And I just want to say that I know that Wonder Woman 1984 is having a bit of a moment in this course right now. And I'm not the least bit qualified to even approach the majority of what's being said about it. So I'll just talk about this movie as a movie and my own thoughts on it as a movie. And I just want to get out of the way. And in that way, it's okay-ish. It's definitely very lucky to have come out on video on demand. Like I was saying in previous episodes, a lot of the griping over WB's decision to put everything on HBO Max by creators really looks silly given how many things that have gone straight to streaming had that direct-to-video quality more often than not. And while I didn't think Wonder Woman 2 would fall under that umbrella, I was pretty optimistic about the movie before it came out. It unfortunately did. Now, I did like it. I thought it had some great beats, some really decent to engaging emotional cores, and then most of the key actors did a wonderful job. Like, I understand that Pedro Pascal has become a bit of a meme for how much of the way he carries through the movie. I mean, he's basically the brunt of the emotional, philosophical, intimate impact of the film, and kudos to him for that. No one else is actually slacking either. Gal Gadot in particular is a lot more confident and believable of her former this time around. She's able to hold her own in many scenes with the other actors and forge pretty decent dynamics throughout the movie. Unlike the first, where everyone else was keeping it afloat, there are some key moments and scenes where Gal actually does shine and hold her own weight. The same goes for Chris Pine's return and even Kristen Wiig as Cheetah. They're both entertaining to see. But that's also where the cracks start to show. While the characters are fun and the actors doing a great job portraying and maintaining the energy of the characters, it's the movie and its narrative that is letting everything else down. This is a movie that's over two and a half hours long. And unlike some other really long comic movies like Aquaman or Infinity War, it feels that long. The movie strains against itself to justify that runtime. Every scene, every set piece, and every arc is bloated to the point of being meandering. And honestly, very first draft feeling. It feels amateurish. It feels unfinished. There are so many places in the movie where it just stops and acts as though it's stalling for time. A lot of this has to do with the fact that we're following about three to four different character threads. Wonder Woman dealing with her own loneliness and trying to reconnect and preserve what she had with Steve. Steve's own fish out water experiences and coming to terms and getting closure with his own death. Max's own rise and fall and rise in terms of megalomania and bond with his family. And then Cheetah's growing friends with Diana and then fall to a villain. All these are given as much time and scenes as possible, as though they were the own main threads of their own movies. You're basically watching four different, distinct, substantial plots play out all at once, and they're fighting for the spotlight all steps of the way. That's why it kind of feels like it drags on, because it's waiting in itself for each plot to catch up with the rest before it can, you know, do it all over again. And that's not very fun. To go back to my previous examples of Aquaman and Infinity War, everything in those movies is quick, brief, but expansive set pieces and beats that keep momentum moving and evolving. Here we get about 30 to 40 cumulative minutes of exploring Cheetah's backstory before she even becomes a villain, which is insane. But it's a good rule of thumb for why this movie is as long as it is, because that happens with everything in every character, and it's also pretty self-evident for why and how it could have been streamlined. A lot of things are just given so indulgently a screen presence that they could have been stripped down and still retained all impact. Hell, they could have gained even more impact. Instead of having drawn out sequences with Steve Trevor not knowing about 80s stuff and thus delaying actually moving forward the plot and the conflict, sprinkle that into the ongoing action and mystery that they eventually embark on together to solve. Or how about instead of spending so much time showing Cheetah's previous non-evil characterization, keep one or two of the really good moments 
that she gets as her normal self and then pivot to an increasingly less friendly less likable villain because it takes until like the middle of the third act for her to make that shift and it's all tell no show it's ludicrous and it really does fall flat it fumbles it Correction point, maybe use this to tether her to Max and his evil plans earlier, and then use this dynamic to show both of their arcs in tandem, instead of wasting time showing them both of them separately in excruciating detail. It's just a lot of lulls, and the energy, pacing, and structure is just not there. There is a good movie hidden somewhere in here. Hell, there might be even a wonderful movie somewhere in here. But it's definitely something that was two drafts off and in desperate need of a story editor. That said, I didn't hate it. And while I was disappointed massively, I didn't feel bad after watching it. Pedro Pascal, as praised as he is, really does do an amazing job. His arc as Max and the decision to make Max Latino or South American really hit me. It really reminded me of my father and the Latino self-help gurus he would obsess over. And all the thematic stuff behind his character, it just added that extra kick to him. And it just made him so memorable to me. And it's not something that's going to leave me anytime soon. And there are other many fun highlights scattered throughout. And that's the rub. They're scattered. Uh, they're so disparate. It takes so long to get to each one of these highlights. Their first movie, even if it was kind of generic, was a simple, tight story. And so you had a lot of strength to strength to strength stuff. This is a lot more ambitious. And it hits that mark of ambitiousness every now and then. But it's also overly complicated and a slog by comparison. I'll probably watch it again. I've already watched it like three times with different sets of friends. and But it's not something that I'll rank high. And I'm just glad I didn't see it in theaters. Overall, 5.5 out of 10 and 2 thumbs middle. Anyway, let's move on into the second annual Unsourced Walled Favorites of 2020 Awards. Which is, you know... Basically anything and everything that I reviewed uh, and see what people actually like. And our first category is favorite concluded mini or maxi series non-2020. And we have a tie for first place with Dial H for Hero and Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen. They both really deserve it. While I wasn't the biggest fan of Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, I did love Dial H for Hero. And I could tell that Jimmy Olsen, from what I read, was vibing along the same lines. So well deserved. Our second place, and honestly, if I could have done this all over again, I would have hoped that it would be a three-way tie, is Martian Manhunter, also known as Martian Manhunter Legacy, from Steve Orlando and Riley Rosmo. And we have a tie, like a six-way tie, between Dead Eyes, The Question, The Deaths of Vic Sage, A Basket Full of Heads, Metal Men, American Jesus, The New Messiah, Stray Bullets, Sunshine and Roses, and Zora, Control Free Conspiracy. And we also have Second Coming at zero votes. So that's well deserved too. Next up, we have Favorite Original Graphic Novel. The two in this category were The Lords of Misery and Green Lantern Earth 1 Volume 2. And the winner is Green Lantern Earth 1 Volume 2. Lords of Misery got zero votes. Next up, our next category is Favorite Ongoing 2020 Mini or Maxi Series. We have a single winner this time with The Other History of the DC Universe. A tie for second place with American Vampire 1976 and Sweet Tooth to Return. And a tie for third place with Grendel Devil's Odyssey and Kick-Ass vs. Hit-Girl. And at no votes, we have Strange Adventures, Rorschach, The Rise of Ultraman, Maestro, and The Boys, Dear Becky. Our next category is Favorite Concluded 2020 Maxi Series or Miniseries. And in first place, we have Billionaire Island. Tied for second place, we have Outer Darkness slash Chew and Alien, the original screenplay. And at no votes, we have Captain Ginger, Season 2, and Batman 3 Jokers. Moving ahead, we have Favorite Concluding Run or Series. In first place, we have John Constantine, Hellblazer, from Simon Spurrier. And tied for second place, we have The Dreaming, also by Simon Spurrier, and Hawkman, by Robert Venditti. At no votes, we have Red Hood, by Lobdell, The Flash, by Williamson, and Shazam, by Jeff Johns. Our next category is Favorite Ongoing Series. In first place, we have The Immortal Hulk. In second place, we have Boy Max Immortal. In third place, we have Chu. And at no votes, we have All America Comics. And we have a special category because of how much there was. I had to give it its own category. We have Favorite X-Men Ongoing. And we have like a seven-way tie with X-Men, X-Force, X-Factor, Cable, Marauders, Hellions, and Sword. At no votes, we have Excalibur, Wolverine, and New Mutants. That's a shame. I, th I thought, you know, at least New Mutants would have gotten something off the strength with that first issue, reboot issue. 
Next up, we have favorite digital first DC comic. A new category that I had to put in because they realized there was like five months where DC just rebranded their Walmart stories. And I thought, you know, made sense to do it. In first place, we have Mark Russell's Swamp Thing. In second place, we have a tie for Superman and The Flash. And at no votes, we have Wonderman. Next up, we have favorite comic event. In first place, and the only one with votes at all, is X of Swords. And at no votes, we have King in Black and Death Metal. In our penultimate category is Favorite Comic Book Shows of 2020. In first place, we have Doom Patrol Season 2. In second place, we have Stargirl Season 1. And tied for third place, we have Utopia Season 1, Fargo Season 4, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, like Season 3 or something? I can't even remember. I Am Not Okay With This Season 1, or the ultimate, the only season, I think, you got canceled, right? And Umbrella Academy Season 2. And at zero votes, we have Lock and Key Season 1, and Arrow Season 8? 9? I can't remember. And lastly, we have Favorite Comic Slash Comic Book Related Movies of 2020. Tied for first place, we have Wonder Woman 1984 and The New Mutants. And tied for second place, we have Birds of Prey and Bloodshot. I'm surprised someone picked Bloodshot. And I give an honorable mention to We Can Be Heroes by Robert Rodriguez. I didn't put it up here. I totally forgot it came out. And that week earlier, it was originally meant to come out like January 1st. I genuinely liked that movie. And if I could go back, I would put it back on the poll. But I'll mention, I'll give it a vote. So let's make that three-way tie for second place. Anyway, that's it for 2020. I know there's a bunch more comprehensive best of lists going out around there. But I like having to do this one because it really makes me reevaluate, you know, what I've done this year on this show. And, you know, it's not a lot of stuff. A lot more shows and comics, maybe. A lot more minis than ongoings. But I think it's still a good variety of stuff. And I hope that 2021 is even better and that we have even more categories, even more participants for that one. So thank you so much, all of you, for making this a wonderful year. It means so much to me. And, uh, you know, here's to another uh, entire year on, you know, on Sourcewall. And hopefully it's even better than the first two years. So anyway... Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful new year. And yeah, let's uh, all say bye to 2020 and hope that 2021 eventually turns out to be good. It might be an uphill struggle, but hopefully we all make it. So anyway, thank you so much for listening. Have a great weekend. I want to give a shout out to the cover artist for the show at DOTEMCE. Check them out. They really deserve it. And uh, see you again next time. Have a good one.